to come reconvene. We'll keep going. So our next session is going to take a broader look at the context and setting and you know, move out from the specific elements of the, the building itself and look more at the Civic Center. So we had a little preview of this as far as what was here before, but you know, the, the planning for the Civic Center itself has been a very large part of the, um, I guess, transformation of this area. So we're very fortunate to have two speakers for this session on the Civic Center and its role in urban planning. Um, Kalima Moses is a, an assistant professor at Occidental College. She is joining us here from Los Angeles. And Katie Stevens is the director of the Historic Preservation Center at AHL. She's a, a historical architect. And Katie is also a member of our task force. So please welcome Kalima and Katie. The decision about where the Civic Center should go, what its boundaries should be, and what should go in it was discussed, argued, and changed from the time Hawaii became a territory in 1898 through the decades beyond Hawaii's entrance into statehood. The location of the territorial government at Iolani Palace and the Judiciary Building, which is now called the Leolani Hale, and the home of the territorial governor at Washington Place was the earliest core of the Civic Center in downtown Honolulu. In the early years of the territory of Hawaii, government and business officials became aware of cities in the U.S. mainland making efforts to secure a defined Civic Center, and they recognized that selecting the site for the Civic Center was better done sooner rather than later to prevent governmental buildings from getting spread out. Following years of local discussion and even more arguing about the best location, the federal government chose the site at the corner of Richards and King Streets to construct a new federal building, which served as federal offices, a post office, customs house, and courthouse. The building was designed by the New York firm of York and Sawyer. The territorial government then purchased several properties in the area in anticipation of the Civic Center being in this area. In the early 1920s, the Civic Center included mission houses, the new federal building, a Leolani Hale and the King Kamehameha statue, Mission Memorial Building, Kauai Hau Church, Iolani Palace, and the main library. New civic buildings which were constructed in the area at that time included the Territorial Office Building, completed in 1926, and Honol Honolulu Hale, the city government building, which was completed in 1928. Discussions regarding the Civic Center picked up again in the 1930s. A territorial planning commission was created by the legislature in 1937. In that year, Lewis Kane, who was the territorial public works superintendent, presented a long-range Civic Center plan. The plan laid out proposed locations for new buildings and realigned piers two through eight, as well as doubling them in length. This plan received a hearty endorsement by the city planning commission, Governor Point Dexter, and the federal authorities. But then, the following year, in 1938, a contest was held to design the Civic Center. The contest was proposed by the famous Honolulu architect, Charles Dickey, because he felt that this would result in the pr presentation of many ideas which would be of utmost value to the planning board and the city planning commission. It was jointly sponsored by the city planning commission and the territorial planning board. A 10-person jury selected the contest winner as William Dickey Merrill, who was an architect working for and a nephew of Charles Dickey, although they said that the entries were anonymous, so it was just a coincidence that he was related to the person who studied this. He won $300 for his winning design. His design left the existing Civic Center intact, intact except for widening of King and Punchbowl Streets. The plan also showed extending the existing Civic Center from the post office in Aliolani Hale, Hale Makai towards the harbor and eastward across Punchbowl. Two major axes were created, one running Mauka and Makai and one running parallel with Queen Street. The plan also showed locating a new judiciary building just Makai of the post office. The location of this building had been highly contentious in the recent years. And then, although his plan was accepted by the Territorial Planning Board and the City Planning Commission, in 1940, the director of the Territorial Planning Board, Joseph Kunesh, prepared a new Honolulu Civic Center plan. 
The changes that he made to Merrill's plan included making an addition to the present judiciary building instead of constructing a new separate building. It also included removing the executive offices from Iolani Palace to make the building available for a museum. It also grouped buildings according to government functions. Other civic center options that were considered at this time included locating it on the slopes of Punchbowl or extending it from the city towards Waikiki. This second plan also proposed an airport to be built near Ala Moana Park to be constructed on land created by filling in the offshore water areas. This former concept was considered to place the civic buildings too far from the city and the public and the second would infringe upon present industrial property. Discussions continued. The city county government supported a compact civic center plan around the present business center while the territorial proposals maintained the idea of a spread out civic center. Things got a little irrational when architect Hartwood said that suggestions were being made that Iolani Palace be moved to another section of the city to become a museum. I don't know how they exactly would move Iolani Palace, but... <laughs> Other suggestions were that the throne room be removed and enshrined in a new building and that the present palace be raised. Proponents of a highly concentrated civic center favored the elimination of the palace and other buildings that were beloved by Kama'ainas. They said, if such is not done, then government buildings will have to be distributed hither and yon throughout the city. But fortunately, cooler or wiser heads prevailed. Finally, in 1945, the civic center's plan was officially adopted. During the 1950s, lands was purchased to add to what was already owned by the territory for the Civic Center. Robert Midkiff serves as the linchpin to a discussion about Honolulu Civic Center and tourism. He was the great-great-grandchild of early missionaries in the islands, Amos Starr and Juliet Montague Cook, so he had a certain familiarity with Hawaii. After studying at Punahou and on the continent at Yale and Harvard, he returned to Oahu where he worked for many companies but also committed himself to public service. Of note, in the context of our discussion today, he founded the Downtown Improvement Association. The organization was premised on the urban renewal programs of many um, programs on the continent, including Denver, Colorado. In an oral history with Midkiff, he notes that downtown Honolulu was in trouble at the time. Mind you, this was prior to statehood. The idea was to have, a de the idea was to have downtown flourish. When they, the group, started planning, they determined the following. Quote, if you do three things, downtown will flourish. You must make sure that when Hawaii becomes a state, the state capital is downtown. That will anchor the government buildings around the capital. This will support retail trade and restaurants. Second thing, you will need to build a financial plaza of the Pacific, a Rockefeller Center of sorts. Finally, you have to bring people downtown day and night. You have to emphasize your Iolani Palace history, Hawaiian Mission Children's Society history, Ali Iolani Hale, and your cultural attractions, unquote. From his position as secretary of the Downtown Improvement Association, Midkiff and others determined that the state capital would be the first goal. By now it's 1962, and they approached Governor William Quinn, wherein Quinn asked Midkiff to be the co-chairman of the committee to select an architect for the state capital, and we know how that turned out. Midkiff then gets involved with planning the Civic Center, which he called in the oral interview, quote, an oasis in our high-rise city and a visual park, unquote. It's within the context of Midkiff's involvement with the Downtown Improvement Association and planning for the Capitol and Civic Center that he became chairman in 1964 of the Hawaii Visitors Bureau. I find it apropos that, in December, that on December 27, 1964, in the Honolulu Advertiser, there was an article titled, Economic View Good. And in this article, they talk about the rise of tourism as linked to architectural construction, specifically the new state capitol and federal buildings planned for the Civic Center. In January 1964, both state and city legislative bodies provided administrative means to finally, together, plan the Civic Center by forming a C Civic Center Policy Committee and then provided the financial means to create a master plan. John Carl Warnicke and Associates, who are architects and planning consultants, were hired in 1964 to complete a Civic Center master plan. 
Their office was also involved in the design of the State Capitol building. The Civic Center Policy Committee was composed of four representatives, which included the City and County Planning Director, the State Planning Coordinator, the Federal General Services Administration re Representative, and the Comptroller of the State, who was the Chairman. <laughs> Thus, all government elements, the State, the City and County, and the Federal, were finally brought together to coordinate planning and other policies in the Civic Center area. A Citizens Advisory Committee with a membership of about 50 people and headed by planner Aaron Levine was also established in 1964 to represent the citizens' views in planning and to advise the consultant. The committee represented cultural, civic, professional, and business organizations. It was organized into special task forces concerned respectively with traffic, transportation, and parking, historic and cultural aspects, architectural guides and site controls, and ways and means. The task forces rendered advice and gave the strength of the citizens' voices to issues and positions of greatest concern. The Honolulu Civic Center Master Plan Special Report was completed in 1965 by Warnicke's office. And I have a copy of this report if anybody would like to see it later. Um, this report was submitted to Governor Burns and Mayor Blaisdell after it was approved by the Civic Center Policy Committee. The report described the background information that was collected to be used in the completion of the master plan. The report laid out the goals and objectives that were set forth by the policy committee and by the citizens' committees. It summarized the basic com concepts of the Malcolm Mackay orientation, the great park concept, and the stages of growth. It then outlined the major proposals, which were the traffic plan, buildings and open space plan, utilities plan, and preservation of buildings and sites. Needed legislative action was also described, as well as the basis for the plan, including the needs of the government. From the Civic Center Master Plan, I wanted to read this as their, their view of the Civic Center. In the heart of Honolulu is a cluster of cultural and governmental activities that make up the Civic Center of the State of Hawaii. City and federal offices are centered here, and churches, the Queen's Hospital, and other sites of public activity and historic interest surround them. Since the time of King Kamehameha I, this small area has been a focal point of government and the strong unifying institutions of the islands. Today, the daily activities of the Civic Center are the events that determine the future of the state. This concentration of community institutions has been the stage for Hawaii history. It includes the Iolani Palace, the Royal Grounds, Washington Place, the early mission buildings. It has been the scene of coronations and burials, changes in government, and the struggles of social change. In the buildings and monuments that are here, in in the contrast and continuities of the Civic Center can be read the background of the people of Hawaii. The Civic Center is also important to the people of the state for the great public investment in land and buildings. This history has left a heritage of great value and has also left a physical framework of buildings, streets, and open spaces. In the past, these buildings, facilities, and patterns of circulation have been able to accommodate growth and change. Now, however, the Civic Center faces changes of a greater magnitude than ever before, an exploding population and prosperity, expanding roles of government service at all levels, and vast new demands for transportation to link the city together. The speed and scale of these changes pose pressing, pressing questions to the community. How can the Civic Center accommodate the new functions of government, the needs of the public institutions, and the complex interrelationships with the rest of the city? How can these be interwoven in a way that is practical, efficient, and economical for the community, and at the same time, handsome, dignified, and expressive of the symbolic center of a great state? The answer is a new framework on which to grow, a functional framework of land, buildings, streets, utilities, an aesthetic framework of order and beauty, and a legal framework of procedures and budgets. The creation of this framework for the future is the challenge of the Civic Center Master Plan. They obviously set themselves up for a lot to do. <laughs> the goals and objectives of the plan encompassed issues such as that the Civic Center of Honolulu should encompass major governmental structures. It should be located in the central business district where it can best serve the general public. It should include as a core the historic buildings. The visual integrity of Iolani Palace should be preserved and be protected. The Civic Center must be related to its surrounding environment through land use planning, architectural design, and functional relationships, and surrounding land uses must be compatible. Major freeways and thoroughfares should not pass through the Civic Center. 
Mass transit lines may pass through the Civic Center, but elevated transportation lines shall not. Mm. And new and attractive modes of transit should be encouraged. So we sh maybe we should focus on that one as more. <coughs> Cultural and recreational facilities and nighttime usage should be encouraged in the Civic Center. The historic center should be established as a state or national monument, which this has, has been done because the Hawaii Capital Historic District was put on the National Register in 1978. Iolani Palace and Iolani Barracks should be used as a center for Hawaiian history and cultural life. And a place should be provided for a museum of the varied ethnic traditions which characterize and enrich the Hawaiian culture. The present library of Hawaii would be suitable. Following review and approval of the master plan special report document, the Hawaii State Capital Civic Center master plan, which I also have a copy of if people want to see that, was completed. The plan provided for an incremental program for development through the years to 1985 based on the projected state staff office and parking needs. The plan stated, a state capital is the seat of government of the state, a place of vast significance. It is a place where laws are made and executed, where public affairs are directed and supervised. It is the visible sign of the spiritual qualities which make up the community, and it can be more. It can be a place which will restore to the citizen his satisfaction in belonging to a community, a state, or a place where he will find significance, a place which can enlarge the meaning of his life and elevate and expand the quality of his citizenship. The state capital of Hawaii, as now constituted, is really suited to fill this end. It has strong continuity with the past and appears to be rapidly and optimistically facing the future. The main objective of the master plan report was to provide the state with a practical and flexible plan to fulfill the growing civic center needs, as well as to allocate the space among the agencies in a manner which would maximize their effectiveness. The report defined a definitive development plan, it set boundaries of the Civic Center, it established height limits, it established open spaces, and established architectural standards. The report stated, the architecture of the Civic Center is greatly varied and presents no constant form of, or material which should suggest a style or particular character. Buildings range from the New England frame mission houses of 1821 to the concrete judiciary building of 1874 to Iolani Palace to Honolulu Hale from 1927 to the modern transportation building. This adds a richness to the history of Hawaii and in their park-like settings, these individual buildings create an interesting architectural background reflecting the historic pattern of growth in the state. The design objectives of the report were the great park concept. The 1965 special report had envisioned the Civic Center developing in a Malcolm Mackay direction as a great park with governmental buildings surrounded by lawn, trees, and well-kept gardens. This development pattern establishes nature as the identity of the Civic Center with malls and open vistas to landmarks allowing flexibility of heights and amassing of future buildings. Preservation. To preserve, restore, or remodel buildings and sites that have historical value, architectural merit, or high acquisition or replacement cost. And also access, to locate parking garages and periphery for direct access from arterials and thoroughfares and remove surface parking from central areas. This civic center plan is generally what we continue to use today for the location of governmental buildings, parking, and open space. The 1968 Civic Center Master Plan by Varnicky included two pages about a proposed Honolulu Historical Center. The Honolulu Historical Center Plan was first proposed by the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society as drafted by Charles E. Peterson, who is known today for one, establishing the profession of the historic architect, and two, establishing the Historic American Building Survey, affectionately known as HABS. Um, what's important about the Historical Center plan that would stretch from Richards to South Streets and from Baratania to Queen Streets is that it had a two-fold pitch. The first is that it would show, quote, old Honolulu. In Peterson's prepared documents for the project, he said, quote, the purpose of the center is to provide convenient and well-equipped facilities for the reception and dispatch of tourist groups wanting an attractive, authentic, and educational picture of the capital of the Hawaiian kingdom, unquote. 
It would tell the story from the arrival of the missionaries in 1820 until the end of the monarchy in 1893. How would this narrative be told? Through walking tours. So through walking tours that began at an information center counter near the mission houses, and it would include an attractive and well-lighted exhibit, waiting spaces, an auditorium, guide service counter, retail shop, and restaurant. The second part of the historical center pitch that was primarily highlighted in newspapers was the proposed center's connection to modern architecture, specifically the state capitol. It was proposed that tours might culminate at the new state capitol, which is designed to both serve the Hawaii of today and dramatize its future promise." Unquote. So it's within the context of these quote unquote well-lighted exhibits and dramatizations of the Civic Center and the Historical Center that we might consider this political newspaper cartoon of 1966. We clearly see the spotlight reference, but what might the artists either consciously or subconsciously reveal to us about the linear continuity of time as understood in a Western ethos? And how might we challenge the distinction of past, present, and future if we foreground indigenous epistemologies about space and time? <coughs> Nevertheless, as proposed by the Hawaiian Mission Children's Society in 1966, um, and supported by the uh, Honolulu Academy of Arts, um, the director of the Honolulu Academy of Arts came forward to say the following in a memo that's housed in the Hawaii State Archives. He said, quote, in the very heart of the city and close to Iolani Palace in our splendid new capital, this center would serve as a significant and lasting demonstration of our respect for the past upon which modern Honolulu is building. It would be a living monument to instruct visitors from far away and to inspire the residents here with the needed sense of tradition and continuity." Unquote. All of this is to say that in anticipation of the new state capital, Civic Center plans involved centering the architectural histories of downtown Honolulu to fashion a type of tourism predicated on educating the populace. While all of the Honolulu Historical Center components didn't fully manifest, the idea of the Civic Center downtown walking tour did. Newspapers from around the US and Canada in the 1960s and 70s promoted the Honolulu walking tour with titles such as these. Honolulu is a historical center, walking tour worthwhile. Tour of Capital District and a walk into aisle history. Catch the flavor of old Hawaii. And finally, exploring downtown Honolulu. By the 1970s, what we see in these advertisements is the centering of Varnakee State Capitol, whereby all of the buildings in the district are placed in relation to the Capitol building. For example, in the LA Times in 1976, writer Randy Mink proclaimed, quote, the first landmark you see is not old at all. It's the Hawaii State Capitol. Across the street from the Capitol is the governor's mansion, Washington Place and adjacent to the Capitol is the former seat of the Hawaii government, Iolani Palace. While educational walking tours of the Civic Center that promoted the idea of democracy in the Pacific through the Capitol complex were occurring during the 1970s, something else was also taking place. Protests in the state capital, in the state capital about the deleterious effects of tourism on land development in the islands, as well as for native Hawaiian communities and their allies. So what we see in these photographs by Ed Grebe in the 1970s are images of individuals demonstrating democracy in action and its direct ties to the Civic Center. What can we learn from the history of walking tours and protest movements is that the Capitol and the Civic Center can function as liminal spaces. They are structures that make us consider what was and that which is coming next. It can be a space for transformation. I can then make the claim that the long process of creating the Civic Center that Katie described and the state capitol participated in global trends for cultural tourism and heritage tourism that persist to the present day as it relates to the tourist's desire to learn when they travel. One example of this is the Heritage House proposal of 1973. Proposed by the Hawaii Bicentennial Commission, they would turn what was once the Royal Brewery into Heritage House. It was premised from the earlier Honolulu Historical Center scheme. 
Thus, Heritage House would serve as a gateway to the Capitol District and offer visitors brochures and a venue to see films, slides, recordings, and photography related to the Hawaiian Islands. The Heritage House proposal fell through, yet the emphasis on preservation persisted. By the 1990s, Honolulu participated in the National Historic Preservation Week. And in 1996, the State Capitol Historic District was the focus of the week with the theme, quote, a capital day down Capitol way. It included public marketing, i.e. flags lining King Street, which you see here, um, and free tours in the Civic Center, including the State Capitol. Moreover, the preservation of what was once the YMCA um, in the Civic Center transitioned into the Hawaii State Art Museum in 2002 with the goal of not only showcasing art, but playing a role in the cultivating of the Civic Center as an active cultural location for public gatherings, interactions, and engagement. Similarly, Mona Abudir, who ushered in the State, um, the State Art Museum, also served as president of the Hawaii Capital Cultural District Board of Directors by 2007. The organization sought federal designation of this area to garner federal and private um, grants geared toward the preservation of Hawaii's historic sites. So now we've come full circle with the Hawaii Visitors Bureau that we discussed in the context of Robert Midkiff. The sign program began in 1932 that you see on the right, um, identify sites that are of historic, cultural, or scenic value, and they're still being um, evaluated and used to the present day. And I'd like to end by mentioning the ways in which Hawaii's Capital Historic District and Civic Center, its histories and its visualities are now widely available to wider audiences from around the globe by way of digital technologies. The ability to access and download a digital walking tour on your phone or tablet and briefly encounter and learn about Hawaii's illustrious histories provide personal and less prescriptive ways of urban strolling and sightseeing, something that William D. Merrill, Robert Midkiff, and John Carl Bernanke may not have envisioned in the early years of planning for the Hawaii Civic Center. Thank you. Thank you, Katie and Kalima. I'm, I'm happy that she ended on this slide because this is Historic Hawaii Foundation's website. Um, so this, this idea of having tours and, and introducing people to these historic places is just so fascinating. Um, in some of the items in Historic Hawaii's library include a 1941 map that was provided to sailors and soldiers who were here during World War II. And it identified places of historical interest in downtown Honolulu, including the palace and the mission houses, as well as the King Kamehameha statue. So this is, of course, a very old idea. Um, so we have time for some questions for our panelists. Um, so Kalima, I'll start with you. Have you seen any pushback on inviting visitors to come and see what are some of the, the important heritage and cultural sites? And does that have any kind of unintended consequences besides sharing? Does, is there a problem with any of that? Pushback from? From um, people who associate with those sites, basically residents and people of Hawaii. Right, of course, there's always gonna be push back, and I think rightfully so, right? Because we have to think about the effects of what tourism does. There are positive economic effects, right? But there are also um, issues in terms of thinking about native land, right? And, and what that means in terms of property values, real estate, um, and as um, Katie was talking about earlier, in terms of transportation, right? And what that means. Um, so there, there's often pushback, yes, especially in the 1970s. I showed you um, a few photographs from Ed Grevy from the 1970s, who um, was here from California, um, living in Hawaii now, um, photographing um, Huli and Kokua Hawaii, these events that really borrowed from 1960s motifs on the US mainland, think the Black Power Movement, um, using these same symbols to advocate for um, preservation of the land and of the landscape. And using the state capital as one means to do this, right? The Kalama Valley protests actually occurred in Kalama Valley. 
but using the state capitol as a venue to make these claims, um, I think is really apropos for what we're talking about today, right? We have, you know, democracy in the Pacific. Part of democracy is the citizenry, right? The citizenry using their voice to make particular arguments. And so I think that occupying the state capitol is one um, way in which that happened. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, let's see questions from our audience, which I will repeat, but please keep them short. <laughs> No. Nope. Oh, good. Then it. Comment. Um, that you mentioned Mona Abadir. Yes. The capital district uh, heritage center, heritage thing. Um, I was hired as a consultant to Mona to because they wanted to develop a walking tour mm -hmm. and have a map and everything. And so I was hired to identify the different historical sites within the capital district. And I thought that was a great concept, we need this. Mm. But then it seemed to have all fallen apart and there was never any great amounts of money dedicated to this. Mm. I think a map was developed, but mm. like no uh, real, real push to have it go on. So then I worked with Mission House's museum mm -hmm. and, and we started the tour and they, the museum started the tour with me as a guide. But that didn't take off either. They didn't have the resources to spend in really keeping the thing going. So until now, we're in the historic Hawaii doing the online yeah. app thing. Right. Uh, there, there was, there was uh, like a wasteland of <laughs> <laughs> walking tour kind of things going on. So. Um, OK, so let, let, me, let me try to just hit a recap here. Right. So, in, I am going to put a little, a few words in your mouth. Um, where, sort of these planning efforts, they start, they have great momentum, they fizzle out, and then someone else comes back and says, "Let's have another planning effort." Great momentum, fizzle out, and we see this pattern of it kind um, of sounds like what happened things. with the Civic Center too. Yes, yeah. going planning back for quite a long way. So, are there any insights to that trend or pattern, or maybe some best practices that would keep them from fizzling out? Um, that wasn't quite your question, but I'm going to make it the question. Right. <laughs> um. So I think you're right in saying that it, it's rooted in money, right? And so where these funds can come from to develop these projects. Um, I've seen evidence from back in the, the 50s, I would say, 50s and 60s, when mission houses really started to put this forward. Um, you would see sign, or you would see um, advertisements for you know $5 walking tours, catch the bus from Waikiki to come to the Civic Center um, to, to tour. Um, and so then private individuals, private businesses started coming into the process, that would fall apart too. I think the AIA does a walking tour now, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I ended by talking about technology because that's sort of where we're at now, right? And, and what does that mean? My students are here in the room. Um, and we talk a lot in our class about access, right? Who has access and what does this mean for people around the world, people from um, lower economic status, et cetera, right? So there could be positive and negative um, effects to what this online thing can do, but I think ultimately um, it's it's good exposure, right, <laughs> about the, the illustrious <clears throat> legacy of the Hawaiian kingdom and, and today, right, with, with the state capital. And I would think that like one of the only downsides to that, well, one downside might be that people would look at it online and mm -hmm. think, oh, I already saw it. And they wouldn't, they wouldn't actually physically come here to see it themselves, which obviously provides a much better experience right. and connection to things. But they'll say, oh, I, I looked at it on Google Earth or Google, you know, Google Street View right. or looked at it online. So. Right, I think you're right in terms of thinking about the filter, right, that, the, that technology creates. Um, to make you think you were somewhere that you haven't been. Mm -hmm. um, but can you talk a little bit more about sort of how that happened with the Civic Center as well, the sort of stopping and starting? Yeah, it's, and starting. I found it when researching, it was really interesting how it would get this momentum and, and committees would be cre created. And I, I think part of what kept stopping it was that the, the different government groups weren't working together so much. So right. the city was doing their thing and the territory was doing their thing and the, the federal government would periodically have their own input. And it wasn't until they finally decided we need to do this together and, and, and make these people work together and create people who are supporting them together that it, it finally kind of came to be. Right, collaboration. Yeah. Collaboration. <laughs> Thank you. 
Another question from the audience? Okay, back in the back. Do you want to stand up, um, Palmer? You mentioned something about um, our current perspective on space and time, and that was just a quick drop in. Mm -hmm. I just wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that in the Hawaiian culture and where we are now. Right. So I found it interesting. I don't know if we can go back to that image. How. <coughs> You want the political cartoon? Yes, that, that one. one. How it's sort of divided, right? Hawaii's <clears throat> past with a very particular rendering, right? A visuality there. Um, the present and the future and the ways in which it's divided as if they're three distinctly different things, right? If we think about Hawaiian epistemologies about space and time and place, there's a continuity, right? There's a continuity between the ways in which um, you can sort of ebb and flow between past, present, and future, thinking about your ancestors, thinking about who you are, and thinking about what that means later on. And so, so I just sort of wanted to talk about the ways in which, um, I don't know if the artist intentionally did that, I, I doubt it, but it made me think about why are there question marks in the future, right? Like what does the future mean um, and um, what does that mean for us in the present um, if we're using those terms, right? What does that mean for us in the present now and for those who came before us, right? See, I think there was another question. Yes, here. Is there any course at the University of Hawaii that mandates that there would be a walking tour of the historic area of Hawaii before you actually graduate from the university? Ooh, that's a good question. <laughs> <laughs> Not as far know, as I know, know, but that sounds like a great <laughs> idea. Mandates <laughs> no for no. taking students on walking tours. You should probably take quite a few walking tours. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, not through the University of Hawaii, but Historic Hawaii Foundation's recent project to do this story map of the, the Capital District did involve students from Mid-Pacific Institute, and so we worked with their historic preservation class, and part of their orientation to the site was the AIA walking tour. Mm -hmm. So they went with these docents, um, and by the way, that AIA walking tour was originally established by Frank Haynes, who was one of the architects of the Capitol. So, um, that connection between students and the next generation, I think, is something that is on all of our minds. Sorry, I didn't mean to answer your no, question, but go no. ahead. No, can you speak a little bit more about, if you go to the website, I think people are allowed to upload their images that they've taken on walking tours of the Civic Center? Um, we invite, it's mostly, basically a social media right, um, way right. to share your experience. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't end up necessarily on the, the walking tour site itself. I it's see. more a way to, like through Instagram, for example, to say, I took this tour, here's what I experienced, here's what I noticed, here's what I saw, to personalize it and make mm -hmm. it more individual. Right. Yeah. So part of that was a, um, like a scavenger hunt, a visual I spy game. Can you find this medallion? Can you find this um, lighting fixture? Can you find this architectural detail as a way to invite people to look more closely? So, question here. It's very fascinating, the part about the, the walking tour and the, the present future about um, tourism and, and architecture in the city. Um, but I have a question about something that I guess Katie mentioned early on about the city, uh, about downtown. Um, urban renewal caused some pretty widespread damage across the U.S. and other downtowns. Um, Robert McKiff, was Honolulu spared from the worst of urban renewal, or how would you? <laughs> oh dear. No, All right, to recap, <laughs> the urban renewal movement of the 1960s, yep. wherein um, urban neighborhoods were demolished to make way for new, new buildings, new construction, new transportation systems, um, such as H1. Mm -hmm. And what was the effect on Honolulu? Well, uh, with the Capitol building, of course, we, we saw both um, Bettina and David and um, Don talked about all the all the buildings that were demolished in order to build the Capitol building, mm -hmm. um, and and sort of the uproar that that caused when when some of those buildings were were prized by people like the Ilani Barracks, um, but I think that that's that's happened downtown. I, they started once they started sort of recognizing that it was likely the Civic Center was going to be there, they started purchasing properties, the government did, to um, say, well, this is going to be part of the Civic Center, but obviously there were things there that got demolished in order to build these new government buildings and parking structures and open space. Right. And just taking it back to the 60s, right, urban renewal is sort of a misnomer. 
right? Um, urban renewal was basically about sort of making the city look in a, look an aesthetic way by removing poor people, right? And demolishing parts of town where poor people would inhabit. And so the idea of urban renewal, I mean, if we think about, he's not related to me, but Robert Moses, <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what Robert Moses was doing in New York City, right? And we could think about that dialogue and relationship with Jane Jacobs, right? And what that meant for New York City. And sort of thinking about those types of issues in Honolulu, Honolulu was not spared, right? The financial plaza of the Pacific was one of the first sort of um, um, ways in which to remedy the quote unquote urban renewal issue, right? To bring people back into the CBD district, right? To work and to spend time. That's why around the Financial Plaza of the Pacific, you see uh, uh, public art projects, right? That's sort of one means if we think about Mies van der Rohe and the Seagram building, right? Including public arts programs so that people could make their way back into the city and stay in the city. I think a similar argument can be made about the state capitol, right? Making it a, a place that people want to come and to spend time in and to sort of revitalize the, the, uh, the uh, uh, civic center in that way. Good. Great question. Um, we could probably keep talking except that we are out of time. So um, we're going to take a half hour lunch break. Um, there, will, there are lunches in the hallway. Those of you who pre-ordered vegetarian have a green sticker on your name tag. That is your vegetarian ticket. Um, please let those who pre-ordered have it first and then if there's any left and someone wants to switch, you are welcome to do that. So we will reconvene here at 12.15 for our next session. Thank you. I know we rushed you a little bit through lunch, but we still have several great sessions, and we wanted to make sure all those speakers have, have the time to share their mana'o and, and wisdom. So if you can all please come in. Normally when we talk about history, we start um, as far back as we can and move forward chronologically. Today we decided to do this a little bit differently and we just kind of jumped right into this building, this site, the Civic Center, um, as if the early 20th century were the beginning. But of course that was not the beginning. We know it wasn't the beginning. And so we did want to take some time to go back um, earlier in history, earlier in time, and talk about other seats of government and culture and economics for the Hawaiian Islands. So looking back um, pre-kingdom as well as during the kingdom and what were some of the the sites of important we're calling them capitals um, the Hawaiians did not necessarily call them capitals so to educate us on this and take us through a journey through time we have invited Ron Williams he is a historian um, he is currently with the State Archives but is formerly with the University of Hawaii um, Hawaii Nui Akea School of Hawaiian Knowledge so please welcome Dr. Williams Aloha mai kako. Ova Oran. Oran Williams Jr. Ko ino piha. Um, in my training, we've always been uh, trained to start with our mo'oku aoha, our genealogy, so permit me to do that. Um, my mother is Janet Marie Labounty. She comes from Chicago, Illinois. Uh, before that, we, they came back from Montreal, and before that, Paris and London. My father is Ron Williams Sr., big Ron. Um, he comes from Arkansas, where I grew up. Uh, I moved out to California in my teens and made it out to Hawaii in 1996. That's my familial genealogy. Uh, my educational genealogy comes from uh, 1984-85. I first went to college. I went to Brigham Young University in Provo, Utah. I was there for three semesters, took about 20 classes, and I passed one of them. Um, we, we both agreed that I should go home, and I did. Um, when, I came back to Hawaii, when I came to Hawaii in 1996, uh, I had the blessing of meeting my first kumu, Akone Akana. I'm going to speak a little bit about him later. Akone was the director of the Friends of Moku'ula. The Friends of Moku'ula is a site, is a group that has been working to try to bring back a, a sacred site in Lahaina for almost 30 years. It was the site of Pialani's residence, the site of Kawikioli's residence, and so forth. Um, I worked there uh, by meeting that kumu, 
Uh, and he kind of gave me a few Hawaiian words, gave me a few Hawaiian lessons, and so forth. I was working at a luau, uh, making good money, wearing lava lava every night, <laughs> drinking beer. Um, but I had a, 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 a wonderful uh, event, which was the birth of my daughter. She was three or four years old when I decided I needed to go back to school. Um, nobody wants to see a six-year-old this shirt off, so I had to get a real job. Um, so I went back to Maui Community College, and I had my first kumu there, which was Kiopi Raymond. Kiopi Raymond started me out. He showed a film in class one day of the most intelligent, fiery, uh, amazing person I'd ever seen speak, and that was Dr. Haunani K. Trask. Um, I decided I wanted to study under her. I didn't know any better. And <laughs> so I went to the University of Hawaii. Uh, I went on a Rainbow Bridge program where they bring the junior college kids over to the campus and they show them around. Um, they stop off at each department and let you off the bus, and they go through law and, and physics and math and history and all those things. And the last stop, because it's down at the end of the campus, is Hawaiian Studies. And so the kids are filing off the bus and filing off the bus, and eventually there's about 15 or 16 Hawaiians and myself, and everyone's looking at me, like, did you miss your stop? And I, 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 I said, no, no. So I made it there, and I, and I jest, but I wanted to tell that story because once I got there, I was welcomed by a woman named Mehana Hind. Mehana Hind was our school counselor back then. She works for OHA now. Mehana pulled me aside and said, if you come to this school, if you come to Kamakukulani, then this is your home also. And I was welcomed there and for some reason taken under the wing of Dr. Trask and others, Dr. Kamait Lahiva and Dr. Osorio and so forth. I got my BA in Hawaiian Studies in 2005. Uh, I got my master's degree in Pacific Island Studies in 2008. And I got my PhD in History of Hawaii in 2013. So that was my academic genealogy. So that's who I am. Uh, what I want to talk about today is, as she mentioned, just a, a little bit about former capitals. Um, there are literally dozens of places you could talk about as seats of power for Kanaka Maoli, pre, even pre-contact. Uh, what I wanted to do is focus on a government uh, spot, which was Lahaina, the capital before here. Uh, Lahaina was actually the capital of the Kingdom of Hawaii. It was capital before that, but it was the capital of the official Kingdom of Hawaii from 1819 uh, or 1820 on to 1850. 1850 was when the capital moved to Honolulu. So I'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, more importantly, I think the idea of architecture and space and how people relate to that, those things, and how there's continuity there. You know, we always think of these things as the introduction of foreign concepts. Architects today, I think, would be surprised and maybe impressed by our understanding of certain kuhuna in the past who basically did the same thing. So we'll walk through that. I'm going to use some of the uh, documents that we've pulled from the Hawaii State Archives to kind of uh, highlight that. If you haven't been, it's behind us here. Uh, a wonderful place with, that contains the history of Hawaii from about the 1770s to present. Um, so lots of treasures over there. So let's get started. So democracy to by design, Lahaina, Ika Malu'ulu Olele, the nation's first capital. Malu'ulu Olele is a phrase describing Lahaina, kind of an old name for Lahaina, which means the breadfruit shade of Lahaina. Lahaina was one, at one time covered in breadfruit trees. And it was a very, was Archibald Menzies described it as the Venice of the Pacific waterways, freshwater streams, lots of growth, and things like that. So it was known as Malu Ulo Lele, the breadfruit shade of Lele. So when we, oh, I need this thing. <laughs> when we talk about architecture and space and relationships, the uh, AIA, AIA, Architects Handbook of Professional Practice, says best practices include essential knowledge based on deep experience. Deep experience. There's a phrase, Makulele Hawaii in Hawaiian, that says, Ikava mamua, kava mahope. In the past is the future. Now, most people think of that as an alolo no yao. I've seen it cited as an alolo no yao many, many times, but it's actually not. Um, my kupu, my, my kumu, um, um, Okoni Akana, coined that phrase from the Friends of Moku'ula about 1990, 1991. And his idea was that moving forward, making decisions about the future, we need to look to the past not just for cultural reasons, but for a very pragmatic reason that there was 1,000, 2,000 years of history here. And we can learn from that history when we move forward. So in Hawaiian, they had, or in Hawaii, they had kuhuna kuhi kuhi pu'u'one, which was a class of priests that basically acted as architects. Mary uh, Kavena Pukui's dictionary definition is a seer, soothsayer, necromancer, especially a class of priests who advise concerning building and locating of temples, homes, fish ponds, hence a professional architect. Yeah? So these folks, and one of the things about kuhuna, we've always kind of thought of them as in a religious sense. And there was pro indeed that aspect of kuhuna. But kuhuna also meant a, someone with skill, an expert. And there was a very pragmatic knowledge to these kuhuna. 
their families had kept the knowledge of certain areas, certain valleys, certain rivers, and so forth for many generations. They were the one who held the knowledge about Manoa or some other place. And so when someone wanted to build a fish pond or wanted to build a site for a house, they would ask the kuhi kuhi pu'one, who would say, you should put it right over there. And they might not tell them why, but you should put it over there. There's a story I can mention about Lahaina. When the first missionaries arrived to Lahaina in 1820, once Keopolani had come back to Lahaina in 1823 and built the first Christian church in Maui, they built the church, and the folks from New England had come and said, okay, we're going to build the church here. And some of the Kapuna had said, no, 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 we got this. You know, we're, we're from Boston. We know what we're doing. And they built the church, and the church blew down. And they built the church again, and it blew down again. And on the fourth version of the church, they went to the Kapuna from the area and said, now, what were you saying? <laughs> And they said, the Kawaula winds come down through this valley about every two years. You know, you can't put the church right there. You need to put it over here, and you need to turn it this way, and so forth. Um, and that's just a knowledge of place, right? That's a knowledge of the place you're at. So that gaining of knowledge from the past was something that Hawaiians treasured. Okay. So the one famous kuhi kuhi pu'one was Kayakea from Molokai. He was known as this. This is an article from Kanu Pepo Kua Kua, July 25th, 1902. It talks about Kayakea. He was the architect, the source of Kamehameha's victories. He was the chief, a chief of the island of Molokai and was counted in ancient times in Hawaii as an architect. Kayakea, a political advisor in the time of Kamehameha I, was the man building the foundation of his government. So these people who knew place and who knew environment and who re knew relationship of man to that environment were instrumental to people like Kamehameha's victories and building a kingdom. Now, we all know today of the capital is Honolulu. We also had that first capital in Lahaina, right? This is a document that is uh, in our collection of the Hawaii State Archives, which is the Privy Council Minutes. The Privy Council was kind of like the cabinet for the king. And the Privy Council, on August 30th, 1850, His Majesty the King was there, who was Kawikioli, Kamehameha III, along with the other ali'i, resolved that Honolulu is declared to be a city and the capital of the Hawaiian Islands. So on August 30, 1850, was when the capital officially moved from Lahaina to Honolulu. Now, the king had gone back and forth for quite a while before that. He had gone to Lahaina in 1837 to bury his sister uh, and stayed there quite a while, not wanting to kind of leave her body and leave her presence. But he did eventually have to come to Honolulu late 1840s um, for business reasons. A lot of the commercial activity was happening in Honolulu port. Um, as much as he didn't want to leave Lahaina, he needed to. So the, he came over in the 47, 48, and they officially made Honolulu the capital in 1850. Okay? This next piece is a, from the Polynesian, which was the government newspaper. Now, laws didn't become law until they were published. They were published in the Hawaiian language newspaper and the English language newspaper. The English language newspaper at the time that we have is the Polynesian. This is an original from the archives. And it says, at Privy Council held yesterday, it pleased His Majesty the King to declare Honolulu to be a city and the capital of his kingdom. From the palace, August 30th, 1850. So again, we know that that's when the, palace, when the uh, capital moved. Now let's talk, to, talk a little bit about Lahaina. Um, Lahaina, now the name, I've put an asterisk next to the name. There's several discrepancies. You know, the thing I learned about language, one of my first kumu taught me was that we don't know. Um, there's so much that's been lost as far as knowledge of language and so forth. And the second rule that he taught me was the kupuna are always right. <laughs> so if I teach you something and you go to Molokai and they say, no, it's Molokai, you say, yes, ma'am. <laughs> now that said, <laughs> Lahaina with the two kahako means unrelenting sun. Now, several folks, including my, one of my kumu, uh, insist that it's not, there are no kahako and I respect that. Um, Mrs. Bakui, in her, in her dictionary, talks about it being as unrelenting sun, and she, and she cites Mrs. Pia Kakat, who was a Mauna Leo, and she also, talks, she also cites uh, Ilala Ole, who was a famous chanter, right? Talking about it being this place of merciless sun, uh, of drought, and so forth, which it was. If you've lived in Lahaina, you know how hot it gets. Um, so I use the kahako. Now this is from Archibald Menzies, who came in 18, 1793. He says, even the shelving cliffs of rock were planted with esculent roots, banked in and watered by aqueducts from the rivulet with as much art as if their level had been taken by the most ingenious engineer. We could not but indeed admire the laudable ingenuity of these people in cultivating their soil with so much economy. The indefatigable labor in making these little fields in so rugged a situation, the care and industry with which they have been trans were transplanted, watered, and kept in order surpassed anything of the kind we had ever seen before. Right? 
Yeah, Eola Heine. <laughs> um, Jock Arago, who was a, a, who was a botanist and also a, a, draw, a, a artist aboard one of the ships in 1819, said the environs of Lahaina are like a garden. It would be difficult to find a soil more fertile or a people who could turn it to greater advantage. And finally, Reverend William Richards, who was the, one of the first ministers in Lahaina, said, the settlement is far more beautiful than any place we have yet seen on the islands. The entire district, stretching nearly three miles along the seaside, is covered with luxuriant groves, not only of the coconut, but also of the breadfruit and of the coal, while the banana plant, kappa, and sugarcane are abundant and extended almost to the beach. And again, it's been described as the Venice of the Pacific. So you have these fresh waterways, you have this, the, the ocean there, and you have all of these different things in Lahaina, the climate that made it one of the most wonderful spots in Hawaii. Now, the site we're going to focus on as the capital, which was the physical capital of the kingdom and of later the, king, the Hawaiian kingdom after 1843, was Moku'ula. Um, some of you folks know about Moku'ula probably. Um, it was a 17-acre fish pond that was, that was called Moku'ohonia, right? About 200 yards inland from the beach. And it was a brackish water pond that had been there since the 16th century, at least. Uh, Pialani, who was one of the, the Mo'i of, Ho of Maui Island, one of the first to conquer all of Maui Island and make it his kingdom, settled his home there at Moku'ula in Lahaina. So this was a, this is an artist rendering of, oop, this is an artist rendering of what it looks like, yeah? Uh, now, I wanna focus on three different parts of this as a capital. Right? Vahi Kalai Aina, which is a political center. Lua Ehu, the nation's first capital. Now, the first constitution in 1840, I'm going to show you later, uh, was called the Lua Ehu Constitution. The constitution that moved Hawaii from an absolute monarchy to a, monarch to a constitutional monarchy that, that brought a semblance of democracy to Hawaii, that Kawikioli put forward. That happened at Lua Ehu here at Moku'ula. Vahi Mana, a place of spiritual energy. Kalua Okiha, the royal cemetery. Kiha, Kiha Vahine, was the Mo'o goddess, or is the Mo'o goddess. Uh, Kala Aheana is, was her human name. She was deified and brought back as this Mo'o that controlled the freshwater pond. Um, very sacred to the people of Lahaina, very sacred to Pi'ilani himself because he was her daughter, or she was his daughter. Um, he had three children, Pi'ilani. One of them was um, Kala Aheana. When she was 19 years old, she passed away. Uh, her body was wrapped in tapa. She was placed at Moku'ula and deified and transmogrified into Mo'o. Yeah? So this Mo'o that became a guardian of that family and later was used as Kamehameha as one of the primary akua to, win, to, to conquer the islands came from, was, a, was a literal woman from the Pialani. Yeah? Now, I mentioned really briefly uh, a side note. Um, we've all been taught, I was taught, that there are four main deity in Hawaii. Ku, Kane, Lono, and Kanaloa. Yeah? Well, there were female deities who bowed to no one. <laughs> Pele, Kihavahine, and so forth. The reason why we haven't heard so much about them is because most historians are male, and we haven't kept those records as well, right? Um, but Kihavahine, once we, some of the research that myself and Dr. Charlot and others have done, Kihavahine was probably the, arguably the most important god for Kamehameha to, to, to create a dynasty. Kuka Elimoku was his god of war, his god of politics, the god that gave him a station that was higher than his genealogy. But the moment he died, his children would have been challenged, as there were several higher genealogies around the kingdom, except for the fact that he took Keopuolani, who was a descendant of the Mo'o, of Kalai Aheana. Keopuolani was the highest ranking woman in the kingdom. He grafts his genealogy to hers, and then his sons become, and his grandsons are given the right to rule. So Kamehameha conquered the islands with Ku, and created a dynasty with the Mo'o uh, Kiha Vahine, right? So this is where she lived, at Kalua Okiha. Vahi Oihana Kalepa, economic center. Pakala was the trading center. Hundreds and hundreds of ships every year coming in from whaling and other sources came to Lahaina. And there was a center of a market and a center of a commerce set up there in Lahaina, okay? So one of the interesting things about Moku'ula is it's divided, whoops, it's divided by concentric circles of power. So you have this center point that is the mo'i, the king, and power radiates out from the king. So you have the ali'i next, you have moku'ula and so forth, out and out and out. And this kind of supersedes the traditional boundaries of ahupua'a. We have these traditional ahupua'a in Lahaina. Ask any cartographer or geographer who's done research on Lahaina, it's all messed up. <laughs> because we have these traditional ahupua'a that go from mountain to sea, and then you have moku'ula that kind of goes through several. 
And it's like, which, it's in, uh, Moko'ula sits within Waiokama uh, and Waine'e, both, yeah? So because this was, again, this was the Mo'i. So power radiated out from him in concentric circles, okay? Here's a map that was drawn a while back. Oops, here's a map that was drawn a while back. The blue part in the center, let me see if I got a thingy here. Uh, here we go. This part right here is the 17-acre fish pond, Moko Ohania. This is the island, yeah, Moko Ula. Uh, and this is the beach over here. There was a palace, a brick palace that, that Kamehameha started to build here, right? Um, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. The Christian church is right over here on the boundary over here. Um, when they did an archaeological dig, Bishop Museum, in 1993, I think, led by Christian Klieger, they dug about 18 to 20 inches down and found the wooden pier that was right here that, brought the, that by canoe, brought the Ali'i over to church on Sundays. So they would, take, they would go from here and go over to, to church at, at uh, Waine'e. Now, there's an, another great story in the 1860s in the newspapers that talk about the fact that Queen Kalama was traveling by canoe to church on Sunday, and the canoe went flying in the air. And she went into the water, and she almost drowned, and they barely saved her, and so forth. And folks said, well, that was Kiha, because she was going over to the Christian church. <laughs> yeah. um, this is another map here. That's an, kind of an earlier dra hand-drawn map that shows you that area of Moku'ula here. Now, there were, there were, is a fish pond, but there were, there were lo'i right up against the church boundary. Um, today, there's, a, there's discrepancies, we'll call them, about the boundary between the church and, the, and Moku'ula. Yeah. Hey, oh, I'm sorry, Kalai'ana, the political center of Lahaina. Okay, Lahaina is a political center. Kahaleo Pi'ilani. So in the 16th century, it was the house of Pi'ilani, is where he ruled Maui from. There were several parts of that area that were named for him. Kapapalimu o Pi'ilani was the reef just outside, just into the water. And Kapapalimu, yeah, is a table of limu, right? Is a bread basket, is a source of food. So that was where he got, not only himself, but for his people, he got kind of nourishment and all of the necessities were there at Kapapalimu o Pi'ilani. Maui is also named, the, the island itself is named Hono a Pi'ilani. Now, now the highway is called that. Hono is bay, yeah? So these are the bays of Pi'ilani. So again, you see him as this, this mo'i, this king of Maui. And then the heiau Pi'ilani was a, a heiau in Lahaina. And the most famous heiau of Pi'ilani was actually out in, in Hana, which is one of the largest, if not the largest, heiau in, in the islands out in Hana, Maui. It's Pi'ilani heiau, yeah? So um, in 18, oops. Sorry, boom. In 1802, 1803, we have Kamehameha bringing his residence to Lahaina, uh, a thousand uh, people strong, and established his Aha Kohina, his council of chiefs there at Lahaina. This is where some of the first kind of rules and regulations were drawn up around his kingdom. He's trying to kind of reinvigorate Maui and the other islands that he's conquered, bring kind of resources back. And so some of those first, not written yet, but some of those first codes and rules, even under the kapu, are starting to make their way towards law. He built that brick palace, uh, likely the first Western-style building in the islands. This one is a different one than, than his son, Kawikioli, built. This one is over, if you're familiar with Lahaina, it's in front of the library. There's a little foundation for a brick palace there. And there's a story that they tell, I don't know how true it is, but there's a story that they tell about the fact that this brick palace was built there for him, by, again, from folks from New England, and it's literally brick, and it had a couple windows, and Lahaina being unrelenting sun, they said it was basically a big pizza oven. <laughs> and so he always let captains that came into shore stay at his palace. <laughs> yeah. No, I'll stay in the thatched hut over at Moku'ula, you stay in the palace. Okay? Um, Keopuolani, Keopuolani from Waiehu Maui. Yeah, again, the, most, the highest ranking, most sacred woman in the kingdom at her time. She comes back to Maui in 1832. I'm sorry, that's, that, that date's wrong, it's 1823. I don't have dyslexia, I just made a mistake. Uh, 1823, she comes back to Maui because she's kind of tired of Honolulu, she wants to go back home, and she brings with her Reverend Richards and founds the first church in Maui, Waine'e Church. They just celebrated their 190th anniversary, um, 195th actually. So um, that church becomes kind of, and, and we, we know she became the first Christian convert so that becomes a, a very big, important center also. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. It's called Ebenezer Church, eventually called Waine'e, and today called Waiola. So laws. So now we start to have these codified, written, printed laws. At the Hawaii State Archives, we have a couple dozen of the actual first printed laws in Hawaii. 
Yeah? This is an example of one of them that was passed from Lahaina. This is Kekanavai no Kaho'ole i Kapope. For those of you who speak Hawaiian, it, it's kind of funny. Um, the, it's, it's the law to make none to the Pope, or to make done with the Pope. It was the law banishing Catholics from the islands. Yeah? So it was passed by Kamehameha III, Lahaina Maui, December 18, 1837. So the law banishing the Catholic Church from Hawaii was passed from there at Lua'ehu in Lahaina. This is probably one of the most important documents in Hawaiian history. This is the 1840 Kumu Kanavai. A little side note also, a little context. This was literally, now the, the understanding we've had about Hawaiian history has been not only changing, but being revolutionized over the last 20 years. And that's because of the inclusion of native voice. 20, 30 years ago, um, everything was about, well, the foreigners showed up, imposed their will, brought Hawaii from this, you know, perfect place to this awful place of foreign ways. What we've understood by accessing the Hawaiian language voice, many of us, is that, is native agency, is that Kawikioli in the 1830s was smart enough to recognize that the world was coming. By the 1830s, the Spanish had taken the Marquesas, the French were looking at Tahiti, the Spanish were also looking at other islands in the Pacific, and Hawaii was next. Hawaii was in the middle of the Pacific, the most geographic good spot in the Pacific, and he knew it was next. The only chance he had to save his kingdom and its independence was to, was to gain recognition as a co-equal, which would have been impossible, had never been done by any non-European country. But he starts on that by doing this, by transforming to a Western style of government. I don't know, as a historian, one of my fields is world history. I don't know of another example where a monarch, an absolute monarch, not only absolute monarch, but a divine monarch, he said he wanted something, it was his. Ownership, he owned everything. He gave up voluntarily two-thirds of that power to create a constitutional government that had a legislature and a judiciary. Yeah? And he did that to save the nation. Three years later, he'll send out diplomats to gain recognition. They'll be successful. And on November 28, 1843, Hawaii was recognized as a sovereign and independent nation by the French and the English, something that no other non-European-born nation had ever done, and something no nation in Oceania ever did Right to that point. So, he starts out, so this wasn't an imposed constitution. This was Kawikioli's work to say, we're going to gain recognition and save the islands. And that constitution was, was debated, was drafted, was thought about, and passed at Lua'ehu in, in Lahaina Maui. Mana, so, as, so we've got the political side, the spiritual side, Lahaina as a spiritual center. Kalua Okiha. So, okay. Um, La'ie Lohilohe and Pialani, the mother and father, have three children. The children are Lono Apialani, who became a king of Maui, Kiha Apialani, who became a king of Maui, and Kala Aiheana. Yeah? Kiha Vahini Mokuhinia, Kala Maula, Kala Aiheana. Now, she was the daughter who was deified. The image you see over here is a pretty remarkable image. There, at the time of the overthrow of the Kapu, at the burning of the idols and so forth, many of these things were destroyed, especially the ones of Kiha. There's one existent image of her in the world, and it's, this is a photograph of it. Um, from, it's in an ethnology museum in Berlin, um, and it says Polynesian God. <laughs> I don't know anything about it. So, and, and, but I'll assure you, it wasn't stolen. Um, th this ki'i was actually found in Lapahoehoe, Iki, on the big island, by, a, by Hawaiians who were actually digging a hole to, create, to make a still for a kolehao. Um, and they found this, and, Herbert, and, and a man named Arning, who had been brought here by Kalakaua to study bacteriology and, and Hansen's disease and so forth, went to the Big Island, brought it, and purchased it to bring home. Um, from the accession records at the museum in Berlin, I was able to access those. Literally in the accession records, it sell, tells the story of the fact that when it was brought into town in La Pahoy Hoy, everyone in town broke out with, with, with uh, boils on their faces. And the kahuna said, put it back. And so they put it back. But he hired two other folks to go and get it and bring it back to him. Now, that said, Arning brought this, along with 400 other artifacts, <clears throat> to Kalakaua, and, and Kalakaua gave him permission to take them. Kalakaua had a painting made of it that we've had for years and years, and we've got the painting of it, but, he, but he didn't, it wasn't stolen, so we can't make the argument to the museum, give it back. We can make a cultural argument, but not a legal one. But uh, I'm just fascinated with the fact that, that this is the solo image of Kiha Vahine. Um, you'll see the mother of pearl eyes, the human teeth, uh, and, a, and a stance that you never see in Ki'i for, from Hawaii. Yeah? Uh, many kupuna I've talked to aren't, you know, have, aren't sure. What they've told me is this, this might have something to do with birthing. Yeah? So that's Kiha Vahine. 
The second one uh, about, about um, spirit is kapahu o nahiana'ena, the feather skirt of nahiana'ena. There in Lahaina, the main thing on everyone's mind, as it was across the, the archipelago, was death from disease. The, the, the lowest estimates talk about an 80 to 85% loss in population from, from contact, right? And so everyone's worried, how are we going to answer this question? Two answers in the 1830s, 1820s, 1830s. One is this new god, Jehovah, who obviously has power. The missionaries aren't catching this disease. They've got, they're, they're not dying. So one access was that. Keopulani is on board there, along with Kaohumanu. But Kawikioli, the king, doesn't want to throw away 2,000 years of understanding of tradition, which was the highest bloodlines can create an Akua by joining in an, in an Iaupio union, in an incestuous union, to create a god so powerful it will end this death and disease. So he starts a project here in Lahaina, there in Lahaina, to build a feather cape for, for Nahiana'ena. Now, two things. Women weren't allowed to wear feathers at the time. It was kapu. And also, a pa'u had never been created. It was always a cape. Uh, again, this, isn't, this is just um, a theory that myself and Dr. Charlotte both have, have put forward, is the fact that this cape, this pa'u, was meant to glorify her ma'i, her, her, her vagina, her ability to procreate this new god. So instead of a cloak, she has a cape. She wore this cape. This cape has one million, approximately one million O'o feathers, largest piece of feather work in the world. O'o had about eight to 12 feathers on each bird. Now, I'm not very good at math, but you're talking about a hundred and something thousand birds for this one piece. That wasn't a Lahaina project. That was a national project. So across the archipelago, they, gained, they put this thing together. In Lahaina, they created, and she wore it twice. A picture you see there is of it. It was 20 feet long by two and a half feet wide. The picture you see there is of its current state at Michigan Museum. It's 10 feet by five feet. And that's because we, we don't know who. We believe it's Kawikioli cut it at her death and sewed it that way. And I, and I believe the reason he did that is so that no one would wear it for moving forward. But it was used as a cover for the caskets of future Ali'i, and Bishop Museum holds it today. But it is, it is a 20 foot by two and a half foot pa'u. And that was done, again, at Moku'ula to sanctify this, this creation of an akua that would solve this problem that plagued the nation. Okay. Um, also in Lahaina, we have Pohaku Ohaola, which was the birthing rock just outside the library there in the water. This is where Ali'i Nui were born. Genealogies would be, would be chanted, and they would, be give, they would give birth there. This is where Kala'ahiana was born. Right. Um, then we move to the new religion. This is actually the Bible of Kahumanu, given to her in, in 1817. And we have the, the introduction of Christianity. And again, in Lahaina is its center, because that's where she is. That's where the queen is. Another incredible photograph that was just discovered about five years ago, Hawaiian Mission Houses Museum. We had no images of the church in this 1850s to 1890s period, and certainly no images of Moku'ula, but that is. This is a daguerreotype from 1854-55, taken from Front Street, and you see Moku'ula there, the water. And in the background is the church is the Waina'e Church. Okay. Um, plan of the church in the 1870s and 80s. You see the burial ground here. I'm going to talk about the royal burial ground in a minute. Um, in Maimana'o, equal to Mauna Ala, some of the most sacred and important ali'i buried there in Lahaina. How many people visit those graves? How many people um, know about those graves? There's a group called Nakia'i Waina'e that's been taking care of that for several years. Um, and here is an image, right? So... The friends of Moku'ula, the, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Nakia um, Iawane'e, the gentleman who runs it is um, Tamalele Kalele Iki, who has had that kuleana of taking care of the graveyard for about 30 years. Uh, he, and he went out by himself, basically, and watered every Saturday and took care of the graves and so forth, kept the genealogies, was there when Kapuna came by and asked questions about their ancestors. Um, that turned into a committee called Nakia Iawane'e. They started about 10 years ago taking care of the graves and also giving tours to schools and so forth. And I want to list for you some of the mo'i that are buried there. Mo'i wahine keopuolani. Again, in her time, the most sacred woman in the kingdom, the most powerful. Now, many of you have probably heard the story, probably true, of the fact that Kamehameha was not allowed to approach his wife other than on his hands and knees because she outranked him quite a bit. Um, so this was keopuolani. So she's buried there. Harriet keopuolani nahiana'ena, their daughter. Right, that, that had the that had the pa'u. Now, when Nahiana died in September of 18, or, I'm sorry, December of 1836, she had just given birth three months earlier to the future king. So we mentioned I mentioned that that Neopio mating. Um, she was originally supposed to be with Alexander. I'm sorry, Liho Liho, Kamehameha II, but he goes to London and dies in London. So when he returns, 
Kawikioli becomes king, and so now she's, this is this, this union that's supposed to be. The missionaries married her off to a prince to try to kind of prevent this, but she, and she was torn between her duties to the old and the new, but she ends up going out to Honolulu and being with Kawikioli. And the interesting part about it is there's several, I would say I've, I've seen six or seven different accounts of them being together to, to create this child. And more importantly, there was a point in the newspaper when Kawikioli sent a crier out throughout town to announce what was going on. And you might think that odd, but he wanted to make sure when the child was born nine months from now, people would know that's his child, right? I'm claiming this child is the son of me and her who's going to be the king, who's going to be the problem, answer to this problem we have. So they have a child who's born in September of 1836. The child passes after a few hours. Nahianana passes three months later. She dies December 30th, 1836. Kawikioli takes her back to his house in Halialuhe, which is just behind us here. He, he had a palace here called Halialuhe, with a luhe fern. He takes her body there and refuses to part with her body. The newspapers ask every week, when's he going to bury her? Um, she died December 30th. On February 4th, he has a funeral for her at Kawaiahao, um, and then brings her back to his house. Um, in April, so she, remember she died in December, in April, he buys a ship called the Kitote, a Spanish ship, and creates this armada, which is the, kind of the first Royal Hawaiian Navy. He flies the, the Royal Standard for the first time, and they travel over to Lahaina to bring her back to her mother. And they, and, and it, it's described in the Hawaiian language newspapers, you know, every street they went down. They cut a path out of the breadfruit groves from Mala to Moku'ula. And they laid down lauhala mats, they laid down, they laid down ili ili, lauhala mat, and so forth. And they had a funeral for her and buried her at Moku'ula, and Kawikioli refused to leave her side. So he was there with her for about six years, um, and she's buried there. Now she was taken, she and the others were taken 1884, 85. Princess Pawahi Bishop and others, before they passed, had, had made this move to bring the Li'i all together. And so the, the, in, in, in that ceremony, and Mrs. Inez Ashdown, a Lahaina historian, and others talk about this, this uh, about sp speaking to Kupuna who had been there, and they talk about this move at, in the middle of the night, two or three in the morning, moving the bodies from Moku'ula up to the Christian church at Waina'i Church. So that's where they are today. You have Keopolani, Nahiana Ana, Ulumahehe Hoapili, right? Kamehameha's right-hand man. Kalakua, which was, Kalakua was the grandmother of Kamehameha IV and V, another wife of Kamehameha. You have Kaumuali'i of Kauai, who, who when he died, insisted he be buried, be buried next to Keopolani. You have Kekao Nohi, who became Kohina Nui, and you have Liliha. So some of the most sacred rulers that ever lived buried there in Lahaina at Moku'ula. Okay? Education, Lahaina Missionary Seminary, right? We all know about Lahaina Missionary Seminary created, oops, use this one, Ron. <laughs> Lahaina Missionary Seminary. Uh, we have Lahaina Luna Missionary Student Essays, right? Training the future native leaders of Hawaii, Kao Kao Ali'i su as successful teachers. So they became school superintendents, principals, legislators, cabinet officials, governors, judges, lawyers, all of these things. So Lahaina, Luna, the school up, up and above Lahaina, was training Hawaiians in government, in politics and things like that, and education. Halipa'i was the place of literacy. Lahaina Restoration Foundation runs that place today. It's where the first Ramage Press that came from Honolulu was shipped out to Maui, and they started the first Hawaiian language newspaper, which was Kalama. It's an example of Kalama there, one of the originals. Um, this was February 14th, 1834. The Hawaiian torch was, pre was presented, and they put woodblock prints of different animals on the front to introduce Hawaiians to these certain animals. Now, horses were there at the time, but you have ones like hippopotamus, <laughs> the black bear, you know, the burrow, all these different animals printed as woodblocks on the front of the newspaper. Uh, an interesting statistic, or a, a mind-blowing statistic, over 100 million pages printed between 1834 and 1864. 100 million pages. So when we talk about accessing Hawaiian language materials, um, it's out there, right? Near, a near universal literacy rate by the 1860s. This all was born of Lahaina Luna. These folks are the ones that went out to the, now, this was a c combined project of the missionary and the Hawaiians, yeah? 14, 15, 30 missionaries didn't teach, you know, 400,000 people. They trained Hawaiians who went out to the communities and, and taught. This is a piece that's another a remarkable piece. This is held by the Hawaiian Historical Society. This is a hand-drawn map of the world done by David Malo, 1832, as a student at Lahaina Luna. Really amazing. Africa, Asia, you know, amazing. Um, this is the type of stuff that was going on at the school. Now, the first historical society, Ahuhui Imi Inameakahiko Ona Hawaii Nei. You had a search for old things about Hawaii. 
Reverend Dibble, who was the principal at Lahaina Luna, gave the task to certain pupils, Timoteo Ha'alaliho, David Malo, Keone Ana, Samuel Manai Kalani Kamakau, and Albert Moku, to go out in the community and gather these stories and write them down. Talk to everyone you know. And he assigned certain essays to certain students. You write about Kamehameha's youth. You write about this. And that's the, the series that we have from Kamakau later in the 1860s and 70s. Much of the knowledge we have today about the past came from this first creation of a historical society. The president of the society was Kawikioli, Kamehameha III. The vice president was William Richards, the, 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 the pastor, right? So this historical society not only goes out and gathers information, but trains Hawaiians on how to, how to gather that history and how to write it down and how to publish it and, how, and so forth. So this is one of the birthplaces of, of historians in Hawaii that came from Lahaina. And finally, Oihana Kalepa, Lahaina as a center of commerce. No kekuai. This is a law that was published in 1833. This is one of my favorites. This is the original, again, from the Hawaii State Archives, um, concerning commerce in Lahaina. So it, there's a place uh, just off of Moku'ula called Pakala that was the market. Thousands of ships and, ca and, and seamen and so forth coming in, trade going on. So they needed to control that commerce. And so this codified law in 1833 is passed. But the fascinating thing about it is this is the only law that I've found um, that isn't passed and signed by Kawikioli the king and the Kuhina Nui. It's passed by Nahiana Anna. So that's fascinating that someone, uh, that he gives that kuleana to her, because it was a governor of Maui, and it wasn't passed by the governor, but he gives that kuleana to his sister to control the commerce there in Lahaina. Yeah. So Lahaina, ka'ulu la'au makai, that was one of the other phrases about Lahaina. It talks about the forest on the seaward side. At one time, in 1840, there were 400 ships that called at Lahaina. 400 ships, not at once, but 400 ships during that year. So there, were, there was a forest of trees there in the ocean. Thousands of sailors, traders, and others come ashore. In 1848, there were 150 different currencies being traded in Lahaina. Think about that. And I didn't make that fact up. There's a, public, a government publication that lists, you know, that lists the currencies that you're able to trade. And there's the Danish rat scholar, and there's the Russian this and this. There's 150 different currencies that were traded there in Lahaina at the, at the commerce place. Yeah. So, ikava mamua kava ma hope. What, what I, I'm hoping to do is kind of give you a feel, a small feel, for what happened in Lahaina there before we see what we see today, but more so to understand this, this, content, this continuity, right? It wasn't, pre, it wasn't oivivale, it wasn't native only, and then foreign and everything changed. We had architects 200 years ago in Hawaii. We had that understanding of man's place in his environment, in her place in, in her environment, right? We had our understanding of how you do those things. Uh, the governor gave a, 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 what I thought was a, a, a nice speech yesterday at this event, and he talked about Governor Byrne's words, and I was listening, and it was, it was truly beautiful. It was about the open space from mountain to Makai, and it was about being inspired by the mountains of Hawaii and so forth. That's that Hawaiian concept that was here in Lahaina and, and other places for hundreds of years. If we keep that in mind, I think we connect that past to our future. Mahalo. We have time for one question. <laughs> All right, Anne, the question is yours. The first law was to get rid of the Catholics? That wasn't the first law. Okay. <laughs> no, that was just the one I picked from Lahaina. Um, the, the first laws were about trade and commerce and things like that, um, there were, and also disease. There were you know, people coming in, ships coming in, and so forth. So the first laws dealt with commerce, with trade, with disease. Um, the Catholic Church was, the, was, was early on. I've always heard it was the law of the splintered panel, battle. Is yeah. that? Well, I was, I was in existence for hundreds of years before that. Um, please thank Ron Williams for sharing his. his <laughs> um, we're going to take a very abbreviated break, um, so just five minutes, um, but then we'll start promptly at 1:10. So, well, sorry, my watch is a little off. 1:08. <laughs>